We're live, Chris. Excellent. Welcome again to the Conflict Consortium's virtual workshop. Um, today we have uh, Roy Truix, Temporal Logic of Repression in China, a Political Calendar Approach. Um, as always, we begin with some introductory remarks start, sele started by a selected discussant earlier ahead of time. Roy then has a chance to respond, and then we open it up to the group. Molly? Awesome. Um, well, I really enjoyed reading this paper. Uh, I think that particularly in China, and we, we sort of think about this as the strategy of the regime, and so it's really cool to see it taken to the data um, and, and shown through data, which is, I think, a really awesome contribution. Um, <clears throat> I had a few different comments, um, both about the theory or being a little bit more clear on the theory and then also empirically um, sort of uh, uh, my biggest uh, comment was that a lot of the specifications could be more clear, um, and so I'll kind of run through those and uh, then open it up. Um, so I think the theory is really interesting, um, the idea that uh, coordination events are dangerous, um, and, you, and you really bring this out through a sort of a Quran framework. Um, I also think um, uh, it's a little bit unclear at times, uh, because you, you talk about uh, the fact that these coordinate events are dangerous, and you talk about it sometimes from a psychological perspective. So they are emotional. That you know, anniversaries of Tiananmen are emotional, or that you know, governance shocks uh, make people mad at the regime, and then so people coordinate. I'm not sure that's completely what's going on. I thought about it when I started reading it. I thought about it more as like a shelling focal point argument. You know, these people uh, people can't really communicate with each other, um, and so uh, they. They, they coordinate around focal points. And I think that's a little bit different from the theory that you're, you're talking about, but I think it could be added in in a way that would make it a little bit more clear about what types of events are sort of focal points, and I think that might be coordination events. I think other types of events are sort of more uh, shocks or scandals, which uh, make people, could be more psychological, like make people angry, and, and so people expect that others are angry, and then they, they can coordinate around that. So being pretty clear about what, what types of events um, are emotional or are you know, make people angry at the regime versus what types of events are just easier for everyone to get together and, and do something at that point would be, would be I think, quite useful. Um, <clears throat> I thought that the event categories could be a little bit uh, more clear within the paper, so um, I, didn't, I didn't know uh, if they were mutually exclusive and exhausted categories or whether they overlapped. I think that they do overlap since leadership transitions also coincide with a lot of these huge meetings, um, but I, w I wanted a little bit more clarity on exactly how, uh, how you decided what, what types of events are what, in what categories. Um, one thing that might be sort of useful is to create like a categorization scheme and then have coders go through and, and do those categories and then report some type, type of intercoder reliability. So how well could people outside of yourself assign these based on your definition? Um, and I was also wondering uh, throughout, you know, whether, uh, why there's, especially with the governance shock events, why some things are included and others weren't. So like PX protests or UCAN or like, you know, what, uh, why were these gov not governance shocks where like the Wenzhou rail crash was? Um, so I was just sort of interested in more, just defining it more so the reader can, could do this outside of themselves. Um, outside of, you know, could, could do this in the future or could replicate your work in the future. Um, <clears throat> I was, uh, with a few of them I was a little bit uh, unclear about why some could be anticipated and some couldn't. So it seemed that you thought that leadership transitions could not be anticipated. But that seems something that's pretty, at least in China, pretty, uh, we know, you know, when Hu Jintao is going to give over power. Um, and um, and uh, I was also a little bit confused about why the number of months around the events uh, were um, in the leadership transitions were longer than the others, maybe, and more justification about why uh, there are certain months, like you said, you know, one month beforehand and two months after, or you know, 15 months or <laughs> nine months, you know. And I know that you do some robustness checks on this, but why, why were some windows sort of bigger than others? I thought that would be something that could be more uh, explained a little bit more thoroughly. Um, I was also, uh, theoretically, I was interested in why you decided to just use democracy-related dissidents. 
So um, I thought that actually uh, these focal, these sort of like coordinating moments would even be more powerful for environmental activists, labor activists, you know, feminist activists, because uh, you could imagine in, in your sort of model that general dissent about those types of issues is more widespread than about democracy, and so you would expect that there would be sort of a lower, um, a lower tipping point for for those types of of issues. So why uh, why just focus on democracy, or if there are different patterns for different types of dissidents, uh, then that might be something that would be really interesting to explain um, instead of just sort of only looking at democracy dissidents. Um, the other thing I was thinking is maybe that there are different coordinating events for different types of activists. So like, are there um, you know Falun Gong are there different coordination dates than there would be for you know like Tiananmen uh, you know democracy activists are obviously coordinated around a Tiananmen anniversary. Um, uh, so I was I wanted a little bit more explanation of um, I thought that the definition of a dissident being you know, somebody who promotes public political reform through public criticism could actually apply to a lot of the dissidents that you exclude. Um, Let's see. Um, for the uh, for the data, I thought uh, you sort of um, I thought the, the data is really interesting, and, and I completely understand that it's really hard to find this type of data in China. Um, you know that you you actually don't really have a sense of who's arrested. Uh, you know you know sort of famous people when they get arrested, but you know recently the crackdown on the internet there are a lot of people who uh, you know typical people who are arrested and you can find um, and they're probably don't they're probably not in this data set so I don't think that the measurement error in the data set is not systematic I'm pretty sure it, it probably is systematic uh, because there are certain types of people who are arrested that are noticed and certain types of people who are arrested who are not noticed and I was wondering um, uh, I'm not sure that this is a problem for uh, for your data, but I think I would I would sort of lay it out a little bit more. So, uh, people who are noticed who are arrested, um, these are the types of people that the government is going to do things preemptively to, right? The other people are going to be more reactive. So I think you can justify it, even though I think there is systematic measurement error. But I would sort of do that, and you know, if you take a few paragraphs to do that, rather than sort of um, saying that you might not think it's systematic. Um, I thought that the the uh, the statistical robustness checks and the statistics the statistical models in general were pretty were pretty good and I thought they like I really liked the way that you uh, made the data really interpretable made the model really interpretable um, and I liked I loved the predictive plot um, one of the things in the predictive plot is I'm not sure I'm not sure if you want to go down this road but there are a lot of statistical models that allow you to better predict births. And you might think about. Um, sorry, can you say that again? Uh, sorry, better predict bursts. So your okay. your data are really bursty. Yeah. Um, and that and that's one of the reasons why your predictions aren't working out so well. So there are a lot of models that do like um, internet traffic bursts and stuff. Uh, we don't see these as much in political science, but um, but I'm not sure if you want to go down that route. I'm not sure it's going to matter much for your results, but it might definitely the predictive plot. You're like, oh wow, you're pretty you're under predicting these uh, these dissident arrests. Um, um, I think those are my big, my major big comments, um, and so I think I'll open it up and, um, you know, I'll add in things here and there as, as the conversation goes along. So Roy, jump in, and um, when you've kind of exhausted and wound, wound down a little bit, then uh, we'll open it up for everybody else. Okay. Uh, well, first let me just say thank you to uh, Will and, and Christian for, for organizing this. I think this constitutes my uh, possibly coolest academic experience to date. Uh, in terms of feedback and kind of the, the group of people brought together. So, so thank you for making this happen. We'll quote um, you on that one later. Cool, coolest academic experience today. Exactly. You could quote me. <laughs> you could quote me. Um, so just in terms of this project, uh, I should say at the beginning that this kind of represents a new research agenda for me. Um, and so I'm, I am new to the repression literature, new to the human rights literature, so I'm excited to see um, comments um, on how I frame it and kind of the contribution to the literature because I'm still unclear on that. Um, Molly, all of your points are uh, extremely well taken. I'll just uh, touch on a few of them uh, in the interest of, of kind of getting, getting to other people giving feedback. Um, I think your point about 
the specific mechanisms being uh, underlying these coordination events is important uh, because at this point basically what I'm doing is I'm aggregating a lot of different types of events together and I'm calling them one thing. Uh, but the Beijing Olympics uh, operates as a coordination event uh, in a different way than Tiananmen Square, right? So the Beijing Olympics is a happy event, uh, but it's sort of this focal point type event, whereas the Tiananmen movement, the, the massacre anniversary, is going to be bringing up pain in some way. So I think I need to, at the very least, uh, identify all the different mechanisms through which these, these events might affect uh, the Koran the type revolutionary threshold. So, so that point's very well taken. Something that I've been struggling with is how to divide these events up. Um, and one, how to identify kind of the case, the, the universe of events. And then two, how to chop them up into meaningful categories. And I, I would welcome feedback from others on this point. Um, one issue is that if you cut things too fine, then you run out of events. Uh, so I technically only really have two leadership transitions. And so uh, that's part of the reason why these, these findings aren't so significant. Um, the intercoder reliability point, I, I think this is, you know, initially when I did this project, it was just me sitting with an Excel spreadsheet coming up with events, uh, and that is a shockingly bad way to, to run an academic project. And so I'm trying to come up with ways to make the event coding more transparent and more replicable. So um, your points there are well taken. Um, finally, I would say the major feedback I've received the, on this so far uh, from others, which I think you've started to hit at, well, I got one piece of feedback from the China field, which is that this is an obvious finding and therefore not interesting. Um, and I know we have some China scholars in the audience. Hi, Feng. It's good to see you. Uh, Molly, good to see you, of course. So the question I would ask is, is this interesting, or am I just proving the obvious with bad data? Uh, and then the second criticism I've got, and I, I received this from Melanie Mannion and Pierre Landry, is that I, quote, don't really have a data set. Uh, in the sense that this data, the, the measurement error is so bad and the underreporting is so bad uh, that it's not even worth analyzing. So Molly, I appreciate your suggestion to kind of just be more forthright about the limitations and instead of trying to pretend there is no systematic bias, like actually acknowledge that and, and try to assess the degree of the bias or the direction of the bias more forthrightly. But um, I, my general approach in the China field is try to do the best you can with the data you have, given that this is a topic that's sort of understudied. Um, but I suspect this will be a major sticking. I only have 200 detentions over 16 years. Uh, and so we know that that number is much, much, much higher. So um, I'll leave it there just in the interest of getting other people's feedback. But Molly, thank you again uh, for all your comments. OK, folks, queue is open. Who'd like a uh, Jen? Everybody else, feel free. I found got you. Sorry, I had to unmute. Uh, we, I guess, could anticipate that problem. <laughs> um, uh, nice to meet you, Rory. Nice um, to meet you. So um, I, I would actually be interested if we could circle back to what some of those bursty models might be, because um, I would find a discussion of that to be interesting. Um, but in terms of comments that will help uh, Rory as opposed to help me, <laughs> um, uh, I think the sort of major thing I have is that um, there is this well-known, at least, uh, I mean, I don't know how prevalent it is, uh, Will and Christian could speak to this from the political science part, but in the sociology, uh, sociological work on repression, there's this pretty well-known difference between political opportunities understood as structures um, versus political opportunities understood as something that's much more volatile and dynamic. Um, and so uh, Creasy would be a good European scholar who uh, is probably most noted for making this distinction, but you could find review pieces um, by Donatella Della Porto or myself that also make this distinction. But the, okay. the idea is exactly what you say, that political opportunity structures are great at getting at cross-national differences, but don't often tell you much about you know, what's happening within country across time. But that's exactly what those volatile political opportunities are supposed to do. Um, and so it, it does turn out that the kinds of things you're suggesting um, are somewhat novel to that literature, on, like as categories of things. So if you were to list uh, a list of known volatile political opportunities, um, some of the things that you're suggesting would, would still be novel additions to that. Um, but your paper would be much better contextualized in the larger repression literature were you to review what those other exist, acknowledge the split, um, mm -hmm. review what existing pl volatile political opportunities are known, 
and then position yours within it. Um, so I, I think that that's sort of the really the the biggest picture, you know, recasting that the that the paper would need from uh, from my take. Um, I know I had one other page. Oh, I wanted to say that um, I did really like the placebo effect uh, in the analysis. Um, I don't know if that's exceptionally common in um, political science work, but it's not being done a lot in sociology, and it, it was nice to see. Um, yeah, those are data questions that Molly already addressed. Um, come back to you, Jen, no worries. Yeah. Yeah, come back to me because I think that the rest of what I have down maybe Molly already said. Okay, I, I had a two off of Jen, um, and let, let me let me say of course or start with I love Jen. She is fabulous, but she went exactly where I was going to go, which is also why I like her. But um, but the political opportunity structure thing, because the minute the minute you kind of you kind of hint at political opportunity structure and kind of use it, but then you kind of don't want to. But there's like there's like a debate, right? And so there's a bunch of kind of political sociologists who are just like political opportunity structure is dead. Gowen and Jasper killed it. Why are you using it? And so you kind of hinted there's some problems with it, but then you also kind of use it. So I'm like, yeah. you need to find that balance. Jen has given you some great references for kind of contextualizing it, but it's either like you take that dead on and try to kind of specify. Look, part of the problem with political opportunity structure is one, it wasn't clearly defined, and two, they didn't catch this difference between structure and the things that changed. And if you kind of go to that, then that is kind of a contribution. Related to that, though, is the quicker the other quick point, which is like part of your framing issue is like, I, I kind of read it as a political opportunity structure piece. I kind of read it as a Chinese repression or Chinese contention piece. And then this other thing. Um, but I would kind of say, no offense to anybody who's trying to build it, but Chinese repression studies, what the heck is that? I'm just like, I didn't, I didn't like, I had problems with the King piece because I was just like, I'm like, they tried to pretend like there was no repression literature. And I was kind of like, yo, man, when did Chinese repression come up? So if you contextualize it, then I think you're able to kind of better pitch it in a way that brings in a whole bunch of people simultaneously building your audience and the minute you start qualifying it then you're kind of narrowing it. Long is two, I will not do that again, but Haifang, you're up. On mute. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, good morning everyone, sorry to be a little. And uh, um, <clears throat> so I, I think uh, Rory uh, asked the question that whether this is interesting, I think this is very interesting. Um, uh, people do talk about this kind of phenomenon um, informally that people expect the regime to uh, repress more during these uh, regime meetings or other sensitive times. But I think no one has ever systematically or rigorously looked at this, so I think this is a useful contribution. Uh, at least I'm very happy to see this study. Um, I'd, I'd just like to echo some of the points that Molly mentioned. Uh, that one of them is that <coughs> uh, some of these dates, events, have uh, are different in character. So you mentioned that uh, the Beijing Olympic is a happy event. I think some other uh, events are maybe similar to this, like in the National National Day. It will be a holiday, like people take days off, and people now take three days off. I think in the past, in some of the years in your data, people actually take seven days off. So people use this as a vacation. They took the, they all or they go home. So this is supposed to be a relaxed environment. In terms of a heightened antipathy, I, I would think that the arrests actually increase people's antipathy against the regime rather than um, rather than the other way around. So I thought that, so these events are coordinate these these kind of events are focal points events focal point days, but they do not necessarily bring make people angry. So I think there are different mechanisms that you can work around. I mean, so I think the Direct framework can be broader. It's that I mean, it's all about focal point, about coordination, but not necessarily about uh, making people, the even reminding people of some bad things in the past. Um, one uh, suggestion I would like to have is that uh, since you all, uh, by your current theoretical framework, you um, should arrest people uh, in order to forestall coordination. I would like to see. I think it would be useful to see at the first step. Uh, if there are indeed more efforts to work, to organize during times, you know, uh, um, maybe maybe there are indeed more efforts by the masses or by the political activists to organize around these 
calendar events. Maybe they are not. Maybe maybe not. So I think it will be useful. I mean, I, it's reasonable to assume there are more uh, efforts to organize around these events, but uh, it will be useful to see that the assumption is actually true. So, um, uh, so I mean, but if you don't see more efforts around this uh, kind, these kind of events, then um, maybe there's other reason that the regime is arresting people. I would I would actually guess that if the regime is suppressing more during these events, then if I'm a political activist, I would uh, avoid these events. I would avoid these times. I would choose other time to organize because I know the regime is prepared during these times, right? So in the so in the in the mixed strategy equilibrium, I would assume that people would organize around throughout the year, maybe a little more during these kind of events, but not significantly more. So the people would organize throughout the year, and the regime is prepared throughout the year. Uh, so that's why probably why you only see 20% of the events explained by your model, not 100%. So I, I thought that's something to think about, just to uh, see. I mean, uh, I mean, suppression and uh, organization is uh, two sides of the same coin. You look at one side, it may be useful to look at the other side as well to see whether uh, what, what people. I mean, this interaction, right? What the interactions are like. Um, Roy, you can address that one, and then also I didn't give you a chance to kind of respond to Jen's comment, so if you want to kind of contextualize that, my, my two interfered with um, responding to that. Oh, yeah, so I, I'm happy to respond, although I, I, I enjoy listening more than hearing myself talk. Um, I, I think uh, this idea of the political opportunity, again, I'm, I'm new to this literature. My sense of it is it is uh, a concept that is a little vague uh, to me, and so I felt the need I was talking with Mark Beisinger about this, and he said, well, you know, if you can t kind of map this idea to co specific coordination events, that would be a contribution. But I think, um, as you were hinting at, Christian, I kind of need to, I, I need to do more. Right now, I'm just co sort of loosely mentioning it and kind of introducing Koran. Um, I think at this point right now, I almost have too many theoretical things going on. So I have the Koran framework, which is not political opportunities, but I'm kind of using political opportunities to motivate Koran. And then I have a human rights frame on top of a political opportunity frame on top of a Chinese politics frame. And so there's a risk that I'm doing too much at once uh, and not really doing anything at all. And so I, it will, I will have to think about which frame is most compelling. Uh, but Jen, thank you for your suggestions on, the, um, on kind of the literature and how to, to distinguish between volatile events and sort of structural events. Uh, Haifang, I, I, Haifang, I really appreciate your your suggestion on measuring dissent. So this, I'm basically missing one half of this kind of this system, right? So I have I have the measurement of repression as I'm as I'm as I'm conceptualizing it in terms of arrests, but I have no measure of dissent. Uh, and without that, it's open to criticism because the argument is well, maybe it's just that dissent is higher during these periods, which I think it probably is. Uh, and so that they're not actually repressing more as a percentage, they're sort of just responding to dissent. So I think it would be great to include something on dissent. I have absolutely no idea how to measure it in a compelling way, um, other than maybe getting like a, a newspaper data set of protest events. <clears throat> but a lot of these things aren't actually full-scale protests, they're people planning protests in, event, in advance and then they're detained. So I just, it's hard to measure dissent period. Uh, I think it's probably especially hard in China given the information environment, but I would welcome ideas about how to do that in a compelling way. Um, for Jen, did you, was it a two or a one? Uh, I think a one. Okay, and uh, so Will, you're up and then Milan. Okay, yeah, my two um, is, is, is kind of unhelpful in, in the context of, of, of your most recent comment, but uh, since you, you've got so many different uh, frames going on, um, but at, at a minimum I want you to uh, mention the distinction between preventive and reactive earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. And second, Christian's been doing some of this work, and other of his students, Chris Sullivan, has been doing this, and um, and it also ties back to uh, important conceptual work that you don't reference by Jen. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, you know, how, whatever language you want to adopt um, or terminology, that's a valuable contribution. Uh, it, it is it 
are states able to successfully demobilize? Um, I think Haifeng was suggesting that he's expecting that to be a backlash, that preventive detention doesn't actually isn't effective. It leads to increased mobilization. But uh, that's, a, that's a distinction that I think is valuable. And you know, I started writing down early in the paper, preventive or reactive? No. And then later I learned, oh, actually, you are making that distinction. So I don't know that you necessarily want to raise that to, you know, off a major frame, although I think you could consider it, but regardless of, of how you use it in the framing, I want to encourage you to mention it early because I think it's a valuable distinction. It won't necessarily be to, to many readers, but there are several of us that I think are, are very interested in trying to better understand that difference rather than just treating coercive or repressive activity as an undistinguished um, homogenous set of activity. Thank you, and I and I think I, I'm not up to speed enough on the literature. I'm still getting up to speed on it to know if I've made a con conceptual contribution or not. Uh, and so I think for that reason, I sort of held back on that. Um, but I, I could see. I think the pr paper needs a, another. It's a short paper as it is. It's only about 20 pages. Um, and so I think it could use another section to kind of beef it up in some way. And one possibility is to kind of introduce a typology of repressive behavior um, because I think we're in some sense there's a there's a tendency to maybe talk past um, each other in terms of the measurement strategy so that could be one option another option is like a qualitative case study or additional empirical analysis but I think the typology uh, provided it's needed uh, I'll need to keep obviously learning the literature but provided that it could add some value I think that could be a good way to go um, so Milan and while he's unmuting, I'll do the two, which is Jen. Jen's typology is dope. That's a good starting point. <laughs> we obviously have quibbles all the time, but I always refer to it. it and she might not necessarily place, praise herself and tap herself on the back, so I will do it on her behalf. But, all right. Uh, Milan. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm the one who did not get the headphones. Okay, uh, thanks. So, I, I want to say that uh, I'm glad to be a part of this and that to have a chance to meet some of you who I have not met yet uh, in person. And uh, so I have a few comments that uh, that are in, a, in spirit very similar to some of the comments that uh, Molly and Haifang had. And so um, I would like to emphasize Molly's point, which is that I see this as a full as a Schelling's focal point paper, not Quran's uh, not Quran's thresholds paper, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I think it really neatly uh, highlights what we don't understand about Schelling's focal points or, or maybe that initial spark that the Quran's model simply assumes because there are some uh, really determined opposition activists who are just willing to you know, be the first. Uh, so, in other words, the calendar itself seems to be a focal point coordination kind device, and you were able to come up with it but I, I, I really agree with the previous point, which is that precisely because this is focal coordination, it will be more subtle uh, on the various, there may be multiple calendars, right? So if we think about uh, religious activists, their natural point of coordination may be religious holidays. Uh, if we think about purely democracy activists, it's past democratic events, and so on, and so on. Um, one way to think about it, at least the way I thought about it, is that... Um, the simple coordination game that's along a single dimension, protest or not, that we usually think of um, is incomplete because people also have to make other decisions like when to protest and, uh, and where to protest. Um, so the political calendar is the second dimension that could be time, but one could equally have a paper called uh, The Geographical Logic of Repression in China, a Political Geography Approach that would highlight the focal role of places like uh, Tiananmen Square and others. Uh, and it would basically follow the same logic. And in fact, that model, I think, would predict really well because Tiananmen would be, would be one huge point of, uh, of focal coordination. The capital would be broadly another one, and so on. Um, and I think, so to me, the theory of the paper basically highlights what we don't understand about coordination in protest, and that is 
you know, should we, you know, how is it that these cultural, historical moments and places of significance play such an oversized role in being able to coordinate people and therefore also coordinate repressors? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I also very much agree with Haifang's point on the strategic nature of repression. So what I liked about your theoretical section was that you were very explicit about, so here, here are the kind of micro foundations that I think would uh, help us understand uh, these events. But as Haifang pointed out, you know, you, you just sort of do only the first, you know, the, the, the one step back in the backward induction, and that is that these repressive the repressive apparatus anticipates these focal coordination events and therefore concentrates repression around those times. And Haifang asked you, well, but you know, shouldn't therefore these, uh, these activists also understand that? Uh, and he suggested, well, maybe there's a, you know, therefore there's only a mixed strategy equilibrium in this game. And, and I like drawing, I mean, mixed strategies, right? Are we crazy to think about mixed strategies being played by people in real life? But I think, I think it really neatly highlights uh, the incompleteness of some of the theoretical thinking, not necessarily your paper, but simply we just don't understand what the really good model of these kind of events is. And let me just briefly say the way I thought about this, so rather than mixed strategy, was, well, why don't they coordinate then on uh, the anniversary of Tiananmen plus one? Why, 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 you know, so why, when all of those police are already tired and, you know, at home and now we really do it? Of course they don't because, A, you know, that's not focal in that sense, and B, even though focally they all got it kind of right, you know, it's really hard to think how in decentralized fashion enough people would, um, uh, would get it. So those are my, my, my primary theory comments. I, I also have a few on the data analysis and you know, one point that you raised which is well so what's the contribution because most of the China people kind of already knew this anyway. I think one important contribution uh, is that you are able to separate the events that are due to the political calendar uh, from those that are not and and to give a quantitative summary of of all the repressive events that we observe across dictatorships, well, isn't, you know, there may be syst a systematic difference between those that are in response to focal coordination and the political calendar and those that are more idiosyncratic. Uh, and we would like to know whether, let's say, the, the kind of the severity of repression that happens, let's say, during this, uh, the political calendar type of repression is less or more than the one that happens during extraordinary times. Uh, another thing we would like to know is whether... Oh, mm -hmm. Sorry? You don't give a chance to leave. Sorry? You don't give a chance to leave. Hold on a second. All right. Mm -hmm. Rory said... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about it. He comes on strong. He's got energy. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I appreciate all these comments. I think... Um, I think I will ultimately recast uh, the theory, Milan, um, in, in some way. And maybe I like the Quran framework for some reason because I just find it so uh, intuitive and easy to work with. But I think uh, you're right that it might not be the, the right one to be, to be working with. Uh, both you and Haifeng brought up this comment, uh, which I, I need to think through, and I don't have a good answer off the top of my head, which is if I know the regime is going to repress me during these events, why am I still... Uh, engaging in dissent during these events. And it might just be because there are, there's a, a fixed supply of, of these focal, uh, focal point type events, so they don't really have much of a choice. So if you're ever going to get anything done, you can't pass up the 25th anniversary of Tiananmen because it's only coming along once, and each one has a... There's a, an, an argument I could also make which would be interesting would be to look at you know, how these, uh, these anniversaries are decreasing in... Uh, in importance over time. So the 10th was more important than the 15th, which is more important than the 20th, which is more important than the 25th. So there's sort of like a decreasing uh, nature to that. But, um, but this idea that they're, they're I, backing out one more step of the backwards induction, I think I'll have to do at some point, um, whether in this paper or later on uh, in this research program. So maybe, maybe one brief remark on this is that I think what you summarize is basically that we would like to have a model of focal point coordination and protest that in spite where the benefit of the focalness 
uh, is there in spite of anticipating positive levels of repression or, or are, right? And, 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 and we don't have it, right? So, so that's, that's how I see it, basically. We intuitively think that's how it works. It's not clear just exactly how. Chris. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I really, so <clears throat> I really like this paper um, and what you're trying to do, and I'm really sympathetic to trying to bridge multiple literatures. It's hard, I've, as I've, I've been finding. Um, I think that uh, the measurement issues that you address briefly are, you could, you could make more front and center. That Hang on to, a just a sec. Milan, can you mute? I think the echo's coming through you. Oh, it could be coming through me. I'll just, so I think the measurement issues are really, the observational process that's happening is a really cool part of this story that uh, you could bring out more in the paper. Um, that's another model that's related to but different than the model of repression and dissent that we've been talking about so far. Um, that's the model that I, I fixate on when I'm thinking about these because I'm, I care more about measurement than anything else these days. Um, but so that's just my bias. Um, but I think if you thought about the observation process theoretically, um, you, you'd gain some insight into um, where the measurement error is coming from. And because those models are related, the observation process and then the decession, descent repression model, um, you might get insight into one or the other by thinking about both, um, even if it doesn't end up in the paper. Um, so one thing I was thinking of, uh, and you, you, you touched on this briefly in the paper, but it was the duration of the time in jail. So I was, I was just curious if you had explored um, the duration of, of the individual prisoners. Because I could imagine, uh, and this could be just totally not what the, the government is doing, but I could imagine picking up people and putting them in jail for a short amount of time around these focal points um, just to get them off um, get them out of buildings and off the street and stop them from organizing, um, but not really putting them in jail for a long period of time. And, and the middle, uh, and the people who are picked up and put in jail during the, not during these focal points might, the government might have more of a reason to, to do that. Um, and so they, they stay in longer. So that might be completely wrong, but that's, that's what I was thinking of in terms of uh, how, how, the, how the authorities are thinking about um, uh, that, that might be one implication of the observational process. It might also be that the government wants to be more visible in its um, imprisonment practices during these periods to, as a demonstration to others, um, and they don't care about doing that during the off periods. Um, so those are just a couple of ways that um, the observation process, thinking about the observation process, might um, might help the other side. And I think in the human rights literature, at least, there's um, I can only speak for myself, but I, I think there's a, uh, a place for that, and you could situate um, a contribution in that way in the human rights literature. Um, and I, I do think this is a, the human rights community is going to find this important because we tend to lump all the repressive processes together in our measurement models, and occasionally we, think, we try to break them apart and think about them individually, um, but your paper is nice, and I think the contribution, you can you could play this up, you're thinking about political imprisonment as it relates to other repressive um, actions. And you don't say that, but that's implicit to the paper. And I think that's a really important contribution. So um, I might, I'll, I'll stop now and I might chime in a bit. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chris. I, I think uh, your comment on thinking about measurement is, is well taken. So if I could somehow think theoretically of, well, I, I need to get a better sense of how these organizations are collecting this data to begin with, because uh, it's from my sense, it's just a bunch of interns uh, at the CECC sort of sitting around kind of hearing about human rights dissidents. So it's, I need to think about how their data generation process works uh, relative to what's actually going on, on the ground. Uh, your point about, I, I think for me, if I had to say today, where do I think the direction of the paper is going? Uh, I, I would say I am going to spend an additional probably four to five pages exploring variation in what happens to these people when they're in jail, because I have data on this. And it's really tremendously interesting. So a, a large chunk of them are never tr uh, arrested, or sorry, never formally charged for anything. 
Uh, some of them are tortured, and we have some data on that. Some of them stay in jail for a long time. Some of them are out within 24 hours. And just what I've observed in some preliminary analysis is exactly what you, you hypothesize, which is that there's sort of this catch and release dynamic. So the, the usual suspects are rounded up right before these focal point events. Uh, they're detained for several days until the event passes, and then they are released uh, often without much, much in the way of a charge. Uh, which is, I think is an interesting finding, and, and at the risk of tying it into another literature uh, and just having too many ties, I could tie that to kind of the criminal sentencing literature in the U.S., right? So we have all this, this literature that tries to understand the variation in sentencing outcomes, and this is looking at Chinese dissidents in that way, but that might be too much of a stretch. Uh, but I am certainly going to try to go in that direction. Uh, Will on a two. Yeah, or um, a couple of couple of things I wanted. Um, I I put um, the link to Jen's um, Google Scholar page up there, and uh, she has one of a bazillion papers that your colleague Mark Beisinger didn't read um, about events data. And uh, on page four, you echo a lot of what Mark did, and and for me. It was a very jarring experience to read Mark's characterization because what I really learned is that Mark does, didn't read broadly. He mischaracterizes that from my perspective very badly. Um, and so I want to discourage you from taking Mark's lead on trying to understand how events data get, have, have been used. Um, but, uh, and, and, and to echo um, uh, Chris's point, um, the one way that I like to, th or the primary way I like to think about this that I've not been terribly successful in getting others to, to adopt is there is a big difference to me in the, in the processes that you're studying between what we, might, what we can call public information and private information. That is information that we have confidence is available to everyone in society as opposed to information that is distributed very unevenly throughout society. And, that, and, and in your context, that's the difference between a, a publicly recognized detention and a, um, a detention that only some people will know about. And one advantage of using public records is that they very cleanly help us make that distinction. And this goes to that data generation process, right? So um, if you think theoretically about the way in which publicly known information influences mobilization as opposed to how the much harder to observe poorly distributed information influences mobilization then the data sets you have access to suddenly becomes a really becomes a strength um, and, and then just one other thing on this I have no idea what that congressional uh, the CCES, whatever that it is, is called, and, and I wanted information. So in the appendix, I want a discussion of who is this, back to the reliability and all that good stuff. Uh, right. th yeah, just a quick response to that. Um, you know, so, so thank you for these comments again on the framing of the literature. Jen, I owe you a, a massive apology because I'm realizing quite quickly that I have uh, failed to really engage your work sufficiently, and it's embarrassing. Uh, so I, I look forward. <laughs> you're being humble, and you're muted. So I don't. Uh, but uh, anyway, so thank you uh, for these comments, and I look forward to incorporating and engaging more with this. Um, Will to this this point on publicly recognized. I think that's an interesting idea. One concern I have. Um, so these detentions that are in the database, if you look closely at them, I would say most Chinese citizens don't know that these things are happening. Uh, so even if we're able to kind of collect a data set on them, the average Chinese citizen isn't going to know that so-and-so was detained, uh, you know, at an airport somewhere. So one option would be to try to go one step further and, and find detentions that do enter in the public discourse. Uh, so there were certain, certainly this past summer there were, there were 100 human rights lawyers uh, detained on a single day. Uh, which I haven't included in the data set yet because I haven't updated the data. That would mess up my model. There's just going to be a big spike of 100. Uh, but uh, those, that, that repressive event was well known uh, because it was so large and so many people at once. So um, there might be a way either through social media data or something to try to dis back out 
of all of these detentions, which ones are publicly known, at least broadly, in mainland China, and distinguish between that. Um, I was actually up on the queue, and then, then, and then Jen. Um, similar to Will, I read that one section. I'm like, events not seriously considered as a theoretical concept in human rights literature. And so initially, I went from like 0 to 70, right? Not 60. I went to 70. And then I was kind of like, all right, well, part of the reason why that statement might be fair is that the human rights literature is different from the repression literature. And the repression literature is connected to the conflict literature in a different way because that came from these events-based databases in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you just concentrated on the human rights literature, well, they've made this categorical orientation which avoided events, but that's back to an earlier fight in the 80s where we had this disagreement about whether or not we should be co coding events or coding, coding categories. So I, so I went from immediately being furious to be like, well, okay, I guess if you want to slice it that way, then that would be fair. But relevant to that is kind of like if you follow the trajectory of kind of like um, in political science first, like CopDab, World Handbook, Will's uh, IPI and VICDP, and then Francisco's databases, and then all the Schrote stuff, IDEA, to Bari, GDELT, and so forth, that gives you the event space categorization to, to the conflict study stuff that would be relevant. You could take the whole social route, right? So Jen, Sarah, Susan Olzak, um, McAdam, Jenkins, there's a whole event space tradition there as well that is kind of like, um, we wouldn't consider that the human rights literature. That would be the kind of conflict and protest and protest policing literature, and depending upon like how much you want to aggregate it. So I just found, you, you just piss off a whole bunch of people as viewers in that comment, so you just, you don't need to do it, that's all. Um, and then the second point was kind of like, um, we haven't really considered events as variables of interest. So I just focused on things that preceded Mark's comment in 2002, right? So I'm like, we have we have my piece uh, about elections as um, as independent variables, and and how repression changes approaching the election, during the election period, and afterwards. And then we have Razzler's piece that you actually cite does the same thing, which talks about kind of like religious temporality. So I was kind of like, all right, you just don't need to be picking up these fights. So that was that point. Um, so similar to kind of where Chris was going. I read this as, um, not to add to another literature, but let's, let's put them all out there, right, um, so that you can choose which ones you want to go with. Repression in autocracies is another literature, right? So, you know, it's like you have Chinese studies, and then you have Chinese repression, and then you have that's embedded within how does repression take place in autocracies. Um, but then Chris's point was kind of like, what's detention? And how does detention relate to other forms of repressive behavior? Which then gets you kind of, so autocracies are kind of, a concatenation of individual events, which is how you get to the categories and the levels, right? And so the levels affect the events in certain important ways that you've kind of bracketed, but I think you hint at at different points, which would be really useful to kind of tease out. Um, the last kind of part of the one was this issue of, um, really we have like this, the, the holy trinity of complex studies, right? So you have the challengers, you have the governments, and then you have the citizens. And different types of literature pays attention to different actors at different levels. But I think most of us are dealing with all three. And so in a sense, you're dealing with all three. And, and time is really affecting all three, right? So as these events are, as these anniversaries are coming up, the challengers are just like, hey, you know, we can't miss the anniversary. The government, is similar to where Milan was going, the government's kind of like, hey, you know what? This event's coming up, so we need to kind of ramp things up. And the citizen, citizenry is kind of going about their business that is like, hey, isn't the anniversary coming up? So t uh, time is affecting all three of them, and they can respond in very different ways. I like Hai Fung's comment, which is kind of like, you know, well, um, you know, governments might be responding in distinct ways that are shifting things around this focal point. So I think you might be right, because you had hinted at that, that first anniversary, okay, that's going to probably lead to certain types of responses, and then over time, the importance of how that anniversary plays out might be really interesting. Um, which I think would be very cool to kind of get at. But let me stop my one at that point. You respond if you want, and then we we'll go to Jim. Um, I'll just respond quickly. So I think just in terms of process, like intellectual process behind this project, uh, this is the wrong way to proceed with a project. But basically, I became aware of this data set. I started crunching it, and then I was started trying to figure out how do I can fit this in. And I first started reading the human rights literature. And then as I started to build out my theoretical framework, I said, oh, wait, now I'm really in the kind of collective action, social movements literature. And then, so it, it ended up becoming this sort of like 
Frankenstein paper where I have all these different literatures being tacked on and I'm not doing justice to any one. And so this is something I think I do need some help with, like figuring out what to prioritize uh, in terms of, because I, I, I honestly don't think I can do all of them well. Uh, and I think it sounds like from what I'm hearing from the group that kind of tacking on to like the political opportunity, social movements literature um, is potentially the most productive um, while, while kind of drawing in the human rights literature a little bit. But I'm, I'm curious to hear more thoughts on that. But thank you, uh, Christian, for those comments. Uh, Jen. So um, this issue of sort of which literatures is what I wanted to comment on. I think um, the way I would take this is not seeing, like, I got in queue like a long time ago. <laughs> and it was just after you had said, oh, I have three literatures and maybe that's too many to have in this, in this one paper. And I don't think that you necessarily want to think about it that way. Um, I, because the more literatures that are involved is the more contribution, right? Like, you know, like approximately when you're, you know, a junior scholar, you're most concerned about getting something published, but let's forecast, you know, five years farther into your career, you're much more worried about whether your work is getting used than whether it's getting published. Um, and so actually your work will get a lot more used the more fields that it touches upon um, and so the more literatures that you're drawing in, the better off you are, really, in terms of impact of your work. Um, the real challenge is to make sure that um, you're actually, well, I think on one side that you're avoiding some pitfalls, which is you're engaged in an area that you don't realize you're engaged in, and then that stuff gets sent to a reviewer from that area, and they rip you a new one because they're like, you don't know any of this work and it's, you know, totally relevant, right? Um, but that's more of a, of a defensive concern. Um, I think the, the more offensive way to think about this is, is there some um, advantage you have by being at the nexus of all of these things? Like, is there something that you can say because you are bringing all, some insight that you can have because you are bringing all of these areas together that you couldn't if you didn't have um, such a, integrated project um, and so and then you have the potential in a discussion and conclusion to talk back to how this would influence each of those different areas so I, I would suggest that you sort of step back and instead of thinking a priori that more literatures equals more problems um, that it does we it, it more literatures is more responsibility right there are more places where somebody can get ticked off because they don't see that you have used relevant work from that area, um, but it's also more opportunity and more potential impact. Um, that said, I think one way that you could think about balancing those different literatures is, I think your, what you want your contribution to be at the end of the day is your compass through that storm of literatures. And you need to bring in those other literatures to the extent to which they are absolutely necessary. So like to Chris's point, like why pick a fight that you don't need to pick, right? You like could piss off a ton of people. That's not necessary really to your argument. Um, but B, like which of these are, if something is like you want to nod that it's connected to something so people don't get pissed but it's not really your contribution, then that's a footnote. That's an extended footnote about that connection. You're still acknowledging that you're being responsible about it, but you're not getting sidetracked by it. Um, so I, I think, and then the rest, the things that are really like integral to making whatever that ultimate comp uh, contribution is, you know, they're what your body should be sort of revised around. Um, I mean, I would say right now, I think you have a, because some of the data weaknesses in the paper, I mean, they're not being able to say anything about contention because it could be that all of this is completely washed away by mobilization, right? Mm -hmm. It could just be uh, Chris's first law, right? <laughs> um, and it's all just really about mobilization level. Um, and as soon as you have that in, it's done. Um, so there, I mean, that is a significant data weakness in the paper. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that you go for some really narrow point because the narrower the point, the heavier the weight is going to be for reviewers on a narrow point better be really well done 
methodologically and you have this big data weakness. And so doing something just like, oh, here's a more elaborated list of what volatile political opportunities are, eh, that, that's, that's, not, that's a lot of risk, not very much reward for the likelihood that your study is right. Um, whereas if you're doing something that's more you know, synthetic, you, have, you still have the same risk, but you have much more potential reward. The last thing I'd say is it doesn't really matter, you know, like you don't, to use a literature, you don't have to be endorsing it. Like, I don't think that political opportunity should be something that is talked about as, as coterminous with repression. I think they should be treated as orthogonal concepts. Um, and, uh, and so repression researchers shouldn't always have to deal with them. But when you are talking about something, a split that is well known, it, then it becomes incumbent on you to do that, and that's really the, you know, so I don't think you have to embrace political opportunities, you just have to acknowledge that people have already been talking ab about exactly the kind of issue you're talking about, that structural things are good at cross-national but poor about dynamic. Roy? Um, I, I have nothing to say other than really thank you uh, for helping me kind of contextualize this. I, I think this idea of kind of using the literature as an opportunity uh, versus as a, something I have to deal with is that's a sort of a psychological piece of advice that is helpful to me at this point in writing this paper. So I, I very much appreciate that. I think just hearing you, you all speak, I think one possibility is that I do kind of de-emphasize the China frame about the paper. Um, and that's for a few reasons. One, because I do think this dynamic does exist in other authoritarian systems. Um, and it would be wonderful to get data. I think it would be really augment the paper if I could replicate this in a couple other authoritarian countries. Um, but two, because I, I think the quote China repression literature uh, doesn't quite fully exist yet. There's a few pieces, so some of Molly's work, Jen Pond's work, um, and some of Liz Perry's work or Kevin O'Brien's work, but, but it's not really a, a rich literature in and of itself. And so I don't necessarily need to um, to kind of frame it in that lens. And then the third thing, and I'm sure Molly and Haifang both know this, is that the China reviewer group, they're generally uh, not the nicest uh, people. <laughs> they're nice. Let me, not, let me rephrase that. They're perfectly nice, uh, but they, uh, they would, I don't think they would generally be sympathetic with this type of piece, uh, which is a little bit thin at this point. So um, I think kind of de-emphasizing the China and re-emphasizing some of the social movements, the political opportunity, the repression, the human rights, uh, I think that hopefully will be a productive route. Um, so I added two and then to Will. Um, the two was kind of like, um, um, I clearly was not attending to kind of like dis the Chinese contention feel. <laughs> Please do. Please do. And, and, I, and, I, and I say this for a couple of reasons. One, um, it's going to be huge. There's no question, right? So we, we all know 10, 15, 20 years from now, this thing will have several hundred pieces in it, if not thousands, and this is a – it's like India contention. It's going to happen. So being on the early end of that is a good thing. But every one of us that does this kind of um, uh, country-specific or spatially disaggregated work within these countries, we're always going to have to fight this balance, right? It's just like, okay, of what is this an instance? What are the scope conditions? What's this compared to? And so you have the detailed work on a particular case, and then you have these people who are going to be like, why should I care? Get me there. Explain this to me. And so it's, you, if you hit the right balance of reviewers, then you're fine. But I think um, putting China in context is very cool. And the idea of contribution as compass that Jen laid out, I think, is extremely useful for thinking about kind of like how to deal, how to, how to identify and how to deal with intersections. Um, Will. Yeah, um, Rory, I, I want to draw attention to figure one, which is on page nine. Um, I, think, I, I think this is a, a really interesting figure, but I think it, it might be confusing. I have to confess that I cheat. If I see stuff I can look at, you know, I'll look at it first, try to figure it out, um, and then I'll read the text. And this is one of those figures that because I did did it that way, um, I I got all cattywampus, and then when I read it, I'm like, oh, actually, okay, I get it. But I just want to share with you um, a, a couple of things that um, I'm not really sure that I've got suggestions on how to 
how to change it. But um, the um, you know all the uh, uh, frequency distributions that you have, um, which are labeled distribution of revolutionary threshold. Uh, I think that's actually the government. I mean, I think I would rephrase that, and I have a habit of trying to have long, detailed explanations that just frustrate the readers, so this might be terrible advice, but um, I think what, you're actually ha what you actually have there is the government's expectation of the impact it will have and therefore why the government is going to choose what it's going to choose. Um, and that's not what you say, right? Uh, and so I was treating it as if it was a hypothesis as if it was an expectation of what was going to happen. And I was going, wait a second, but you don't have a hypothesis on that. And I, I literally, of course, of course, I'm not reading your text, right? I've gone to the figure. Now I'm flipping back, looking for a hypothesis. Wait, did I misread that? You know, and so I'm being a very unfair reader um, to the manuscript. But readers do that, right? So, um, so uh, the other thing is, um, I don't know, to me that's the eye candy, right? That's the part of the figure that I'm really looking at. You got some color there, things change, I wasn't expecting it, so I'm like, what is this? What's going on? What's this all about? Um, and I was wondering, you know, so another possibility is to just cut that. Mm -hmm. just get it out of there. Um, and, uh, but I, I think what the figure's doing is trying to show why states would choose to be preemptive or reactive or none of the above. One other um, observation, and this is, I think, the most unfair because it's really just a function of the fact that I went to the figure, um, but my initial reaction is, oh, is he going to have a theoretical sequence? I wasn't expecting a theoretical sequence. No, it's not, right? This is just one of an infinite number of potential sequences. It's illustrative and all that, but of course, since I cheated and looked at the picture, I didn't know that. So, again, I don't know, you know, just figure one colon theoretical framework gives me a lot of space to do that as a reader. So I don't know if maybe using, you know, trying to signal in the title one possible uh, one possible sequence of many, I and mean, that's terrible. But um, you may try try to mess with a little labeling to make it harder for an irritating reader to get himself lost. I'll just comment quickly on that. I I reread my own paper this morning before this, and I was confused by my own figure, uh, which is never which is never a good sign. So uh, I think. I think it needs to, have, at the very least, be redone, uh, but potentially cut. But I, I think there could be. It's supposed to show, yeah, like how the how the Quran framework then maps to uh, detention outcomes. But I that that link needs to be clear. So so I I appreciate that comment. We're not hearing you, Chris. I can't hear. Is there, it, it, who's up in the queue? Since we can't hear Chris, he'll figure this out. I'll just jump in. Um, we haven't heard from Molly or Hai Fung in a while. Do, wait, okay, we have the queue. Um, Hai Fung and then Molly and then Milan. Oh, great. So <clears throat> I'd like, just like to uh, go back to a point that uh, Lori mentioned earlier that um, most people in China actually don't know these uh, arrests. I agree, and I, I would add that actually most people don't know what they are doing. So in that case, it reminds me of uh, a point that Milan mentioned, which I really agree. That is, <clears throat> you need to I mean, the distinction between the uh, Schelling's focal point framework and the Quran's threshold framework. If most most people don't know what these actives are doing, it's hard to see how um, how their threshold uh, framework would work. So I would like to see, so there are different, two different kinds of coordination uh, things going on. One is you try to coordinate the masses 
to join your revolution. The other is the political activists are trying to coordinate among themselves. I would think that from if most people are not aware of this, what these activists are doing, it's not the masses are to coordinate. It's actually the um, the political activists they are trying to coordinate. So in that in that sense, I think the full point um, argument is uh, works works better than the threshold because for the threshold um, the framework to work, you need to mobilize the masses. But if the masses are not knowing what you are doing, then they are not being mobilized. Uh, Molly, you were uh, sorry. Um, Roy, you want to respond? No, I, I, I appreciate the point. I don't have a response. Molly, you're up. Uh, yeah, so I was thinking, I was kind of trying to think about this in the context of everything else that goes on within China during these like sensitive time periods. And um, I mean, the government's obviously extremely concerned about these time periods because they're doing so much other stuff. You know, you talk to editors and they're like, uh, we can't. We only can say positive things, and you know, there's. And then Jen Jen Pan's dissertation shows that they're paying off prisoners beforehand, right? So they're just like they're doing all this other stuff. Um, and I think this kind of speaks to uh, kind of the data, um, the the measurement issue that Chris was sort of was sort of talking about, which is so you there's all this there's all this action that the government is taking to uh, reduce the potential that this will become a collective action event. Um, and what you're, the thing that you're able to see is people who are sort of known activists, who we already know that they're democracy activists, so they're sort of already famous. Um, we, uh, we see when they're arrested because that's, I mean, my sense is that's what the, this data set's picking up, is, the, is Congress is sort of following these types of people and people are telling them when they're, they've been detained. Um, but you, you might be able to get more information about that. Um, and in that case, it sort of, Building off Haifeng's point, I think that um, you could sort of frame this as, well, when do sort of well-known activists get arrested instead of, uh, or well-known democracy activists get arrested, and instead of, you know, when are, and and in that sense, the the data problem kind of goes away because you're defining it based on, um, and. You're, and and the and also the theory is a little bit easier too because you're saying well these is what we're interested in is coordination among these sort of well-known people who have trouble coordinating on their own because they're constantly under you know they're constantly under surveillance and then these, these you know they're also not completely connected and so it becomes more of this focal point argument and I think then you get around a lot of the issues um, by sort of making it more specific. Um, Specific to to these sort of well-known activists, um, and I think also I agree to t I think I agree that uh, the China framing to try to broaden it from the China framing also because um, I think people the uh, Chinese political uh, Chinese politics scholars are sometimes very wary of these of this type of research. You know what I mean? This is like really sensitive research. Uh, in terms of the in terms of Chinese politics, also, and so I think that you might get pushback on that, even though it's I think that's what makes it important. Um, yeah. Um, I'll just quickly respond. I, I think this idea. So to, when I have circulated this paper, that's been the major concern: is the how I'm trying to generalize about detention patterns from 200 observations of detentions, and so. That's been the major criticism, but I like your idea of basically just saying, look, I'm going to limit the scope to the precisely the type of detention I can observe. This may or may not hold true to the tens of thousands of other detentions that happen that I can observe, but let's focus on these. And these are theoretically important because these are, in some sense, the thought leaders among the, the political, uh, kind of the political dissident elite, in some sense. So I, I, I think I will... I will steal that move and pawn it off as my own uh, in the paper. <laughs> um, I definitely want to, my bit quick too before Milan, um, I definitely want to second um, Molly's idea, uh, sorry, your idea, but um, but but also want to kind of bring back the um, the lack of discussion of kind of like the media bias thing kind of bothered mm -hmm. me, but, but if you push this in a different direction, so I'd be curious about um, the Chinese vers versus the English sources, what's being covered, then if there's any variation amongst the Chinese sources and there's any variation amongst the English sources and then step away from the newspaper stuff and then doesn't I mean, Amnesty is has built this career around political prisoners right so it, 
I, I'd be surprised if there's only 212 amnesty prisoners that they're identifying in China. And so I'd expect that, um, I mean, maybe Chris or, or Will could speak to that one. Um, and then kind of like, uh, and then you have some kind of comparison within the variation. Uh, Molly's thing's conceptually a lot tighter, um, but if you start to kind of think about this broader network, then I think um, that's useful. That was my two um, in Milan. Yes, so on, on, on this specific issue, I wanted to say that, yes, it makes sense to... Uh, be clear about what is observable and uh, how what the limits are of it, because I think a lot of people have in mind the tens of thousands of protests that uh, go on in China and are reported mostly anti-corruption, local small towns, almost never uh, pro-democracy, right? So, so it's not maybe it makes sense to be clear that this is this is that kind of uh, activism, but also the fact that in your data a large fraction of these are these uh, anti-corruption activists and and so on. Um, a few minor technical points that I had that are empirical since that's the direction in uh, which our discussion has shifted, which is um, in terms of the model, I was also struck by the fact that, that it mostly underpredicted the cases uh, of detention and I thought maybe maybe some other sort of fancier techniques that are appropriate for this would be good. Some are sort of the, the standard ones for rare events, like zero inflated Poisson and, and all of that. But but from the from the nature of the theory, it seems to me that basically the kind of model that I would have in mind, like in terms of writing down the likelihood, would be most of the time protest or repression does not happen. That's when uh, the focal point is not effect because the political calendar says it's an ordinary day. And then uh, some of the time, but rarely, we are on the calendar. So there would, there would be a model where the likelihood would be separated in two parts, each of which would be predicted on whether this is a day on the political calendar. And then when we are on the calendar, the, then we may use some other uh, covariates like, let's say, GDP growth rate or something like that to predict the number of detentions uh, that might happen because I guess just, you know, just purely speculating, maybe in bad years, the anniversary of Tiananmen is, 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 a, is a much, much more of a worry than in, than, in, uh, than in really good years, but what distinguishes it from any other day, it's the anniversary of Tiananmen, so, so that kind of uh, approach to, to writing down the, the estimation. Uh, finally, I, when I started reading the paper, I thought you were going to say the following. Now, you know, we have this political calendar isn't it amazing? Exogenous focal point effect. Let's, let's use this as a natural experiment for, for dissecting the mutually causative endogenous relationship between repression and protest. And this has beautiful features because these events were happened in the past, so their focalness is as, is, as if an exogenous... Uh, you know, the calendar is in, in some sense exogenous because it's driven by past events. And it's a calendar, so, you know, it's a sharp distinction between, and there's a sharp difference between the anniversary of the Tiananmen protests and the day after or before. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, you, you know, somebody should write a paper like, like that because it's, I think it's a really nice opportunity to, uh, to really get at, what, what's at the heart of a lot of these puzzles, which is, is protest causing more repression or less repression, or is repression causing protest? When are the both, you know, so, and here we have an exogenous variation. Uh, I I appreciate these comments. I think Molly, you you raised some ideas as well about improving the the model because uh, right now I'm just doing a negative binomial, but uh, there are other models out there that could potentially better deal with some of these spikes um, in a zero inflated model. But but Milan, your point about kind of maybe having two separate uh, two separate uh, models in some sense, one for on the calendar, one for off, could be interesting. And interacting with one thing I don't do yet is interact these events with other things going on. Right, so as you said, maybe these events are particularly salient when we're in an economic downturn or when there's a governance shock or pollution is high or, or on and on and on. Uh, so it's possible to do that. The natural experiment language I didn't use um, because I think it opens me up to, I think there is something there to this, um, but I think it opens me up. I didn't want to overclaim because I've already overclaimed through the rest of the paper, so if I overclaim through the entire paper, then I'm really in trouble. Um, so. I'll have to think through if, if in my heart of hearts I believe this is kind of satisfies the assumptions 
uh, for a clean causal inference. I, I'm in my mind. I'm just trying to get at this association, um, but I don't know if you have a, a reaction to that. May I just briefly say that clean causal inference is a very high standard in this literature. So, you know, I, I take any a, any marginal step toward cleaner causal inference. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you know, I'm just going to echo Jen. Uh, I, I I appreciate Milan pointing it out because it did, did not occur to me. Um, and uh, and at least in real time, I'm thinking, oh, that is a nice move. So if that's something you've been thinking about, especially Rory. I mean, I can I, I completely understand not wanting to take it on. But let's go back to Jen's. You know, are you thinking about the reviews as you're getting ready to submit? Or are you thinking about its readership five years later? Because um, those don't lead to the same to, to the same conclusion. So consider that as you do. Um, if you're interested, I have a working paper that um, that and and I'm not doing the econometric work. I'm the third third author on it. Uh, uh, where we're um, we're showing we've we developed the uh, the Puma model that. Um, that uh, that you don't use that that Brandt and his colleagues have used and, and we've got some R code and so if you're interested in a it, it's actually we've just actually written down some R to, to do it it's in um, I'm blanking on the authors but it's developed theoretically in the literature just nobody's ever really bothered to write up the model and estimate it often um, but there there so there are better event count time series models and if you want to take your econometric modeling very seriously, you've got there's a lot of room for for, criti for critiquing it, depending on what kind of a referee you get. Um, so if you're interested in that, I can send you. It's a working paper. We haven't even submitted it yet, but um, but you're interested in taking a look at it if you'd like. I mean, I'm welcome to share it if you're interested. Yeah, I would I would love to see. It. I did do some. Uh, I looked at kind of the Brandt models that he's developed. Um, and they, for some reason, didn't converge, and I didn't have a major uh, serial correlation problem, so I just sort of yeah, we talk, uh, I we went talk away about with the that. time series uh, approach, but I, I understand that that's a, certainly a weakness that, that people will pick up on. Um, Q is open. I, I, was, I did have something, though. Um, kind of related to this, I was curious about, and this is kind of taking off of Milan's point, I mean, so there was this kind of um, to what degree are... Um, repression and descent related to one another, and how does that dynamic interaction vary um, in accordance to the different calendars? So I, I wasn't happy that you started to kind of, I'm not going to deal with these type of events because they're over here. I'm not going to deal with these type of events. I'm going to deal with these. I was kind of like, I wonder if there's kind of like different repression descent dynamics that respond to calendars differently. So you could argue that the religious calendar is perhaps more important than some of the other groups because of how identity and meaning kind of factor in there. But a political calendar clearly kind of fits in there. But uh, So I think you could see a piece that theoretically kind of argues that calendars matter. Um, and as it relates to that, I remember there's some good piece by like Will, um, William Sewell on kind of temporality and kind of like how temporality kind of factors into a bunch of different things. And that would be useful. Um, I really just want to obliterate all differences between any of the social sciences at this point and anybody that wrote anything that's directly relevant to anything that we're doing. We just need to get into deciding them. And so um, I, I might have issues with him personally, but I definitely like his work. So I'm just like, let's, let's, let's get on with this and, like, uh, and, and read it. But part of it is the difficulty of the keywords, right? Because I was trying to figure out, I'm just like, well, how would you find William Sewell's work if you weren't specifically looking for him and were keyed to the word temporality? Because the minute like that's in there, because you're just like, time, cycles, that's going to lead you different ways, right? And so um, I was wondering about that. Um, but kind of the other point was, what about learning over time? And this gets back to something we talked about earlier. So it's kind of like, I like the idea theoretically that, um, that calendars matter, but then they matter in different ways. It's like, you know, calendar plus one, it ch your responsivity takes place over time. Because I started thinking about like some of my like Rwanda research, right? Like I wasn't going to do anything on a topic, but I'll be damned if that 10th anniversary and 20th one didn't suck me in. Because I was kind of like, nah, I'm kind of done with the topic. And I'm like, 
but you know everyone's going to be paying attention for the 10th anniversary. Let me step back in and just like there is something about the anniversary that that pulls you back in. But then there's got to be maybe some learning about that. And so that I thought would be um, kind of like useful to do. Uh, just quickly respond to kind of your first point. I, I think mo many of you have, have said this idea that I should be looking across multiple issue areas. And I think I, that is another direction for the project to go, and I will pursue that. So right now I've just cut it down to 200 dis uh, dissidents on democracy, but there are 6,000 in the data set. Most of them are Uyghur. Uh, there's a lot of Falun Gong practitioners in there. And so I, I think there's a, either a, another part of this paper or even potentially a separate, separate paper on dynamics for, for those types of dissidents who I think are operating in a different environment. Uh, but I have to think... Uh, more about that environment. That's also a much more sensitive issue to start writing about, but at this point, um, you know, I, the Chinese government's not going to like this anyway, so who cares? <laughs> um, my two before you go. One, forget the Chinese government, man. Go ahead. Forge ahead. Get on, be blackballed. Accept it. Never go, never go to the country and have people hate you. It'll be fabulous in other ways. Other people will read you, so don't embrace <laughs> Embrace it and own it, and then get your data from other people. But clearly, I mean, clearly there's something to be said about um, all these different folks that we're calling dissidents and then thinking about imprisonment and detention and police and protesting. I mean, we've mentioned many different forms of contention in the context of this conversation, and I think the more embracing kind of way, the more encompassing way of addressing that is clearly showing the importance of the project and the multifaceted way that you need to kind of bring things together. And I hope you're writing it down because I have human rights, Chinese repression, political opportunity structure, Koran, repression and autocracies, criminal sentencing literature. I mean, you have many pieces to this, and I don't say this as a, you know, you're, you're, you're overwhelmed with too many choices. Um, you have the riches problem, which is a good problem to have, and then think about the different ways that it could be pieced together. So you do have some choices to make if you're trying to kind of do the smaller piece, but you have a research agenda, and many don't, so embrace that, and will. Actually, I think Chris had one, and then I can if we still have time. Mine's, mine's pretty quick. Um, actually, a year and a half ago, Paul Schuler asked me if the Amnesty International prisoner lists were were valid representations of prisoner lists, and I told him, I have no idea. Probably not, but I don't know why or how they would, uh, I don't know where the biases are. Um, so we started working on a data set project that we're, that's still ongoing, so you'll have to bear with us, but uh, we started with Vietnam because that's where what the country he studies. So we thought we could maybe validate with other sources of information the amnesty list relative to sources and contacts that he has. And then we picked up Belarus because um, I'm working with a grad student who spent three years in country and we have a lot of contacts there, although most of them are living in Lithuania now. Um, but anyway, uh, so now we're up to 13 countries and we haven't gotten to China yet because it's just such a big one. Um, so that source of information exists, and we're working on... Ours is entirely uh, an information production story so far, um, that just because that's the way I think about projects when I start them. Um, but that, that'll be available soon. But that, the, the amnesty source would be a good way to at least understand how this other source is... Um, like what the criteria for inclusion on this source is relative to the amnesty source. And I suspect because there's so much interest in China uh, and you know, from all sorts of um, people, including academics, that there's going to be a lot of different sources of information that you could use to validate this particular list, if that's something that's interesting to you. I mean, I mean another way to do it would just be to go to other sources from other contexts um, and to, to de-emphasize the, the China part. Because that'll be online maybe this summer, I'm hoping. Yeah, I, I think that's another uh, thing that I need to do well is to validate the data in some way because right now I'm putting a lot of faith in the CECC. Um, and according to Melanie Mannion, it's just a bunch of kids looking at newspapers. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so I think if I can at very least kind of triangulate between multiple uh, international sources, that would be a good start. So I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about that. That's all our data. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, when you make a comment about like some, some interns in front of some computers, I'm like, who's not doing that? Um, okay, so 
Um, Q is open, one. But two, um, the last um, five minutes or the last few minutes, we've generally tended to kind of like turn back to the author and then ask them if they have some questions that they like to kind of specifically query to the group that's now read the piece and participated in this thing. Will, you had a one, and then we can do that. No, no, my one is... It, it, is I, I can come to it if, if Rory has nothing, but if Rory's got something, that's more important. Well, of course he's got something. I do have something. Especially now that you put him on. He, he like, has to produce something, I have right? to produce something. Um, honestly, so... Just to take a step back from the paper, my goal is to, to work on repression in China uh, because I think it is something that the China field hasn't done enough on. And so now that I have a, a virtual room of the experts in the field together, I thought I would take the opportunity to just ask, well, what do you think are the big questions that have yet to be answered in kind of the repression slash human rights slash social mobilization field? Uh, that might be particularly interesting in the Chinese case. So what are, what are the big things that you would like to see answered? And I have some of my own ideas, but I thought I would, I would throw that out to the group for the last couple of minutes. Okay, I'll oh. jump in first. Okay. okay, well, you had something. Go ahead. Rory, I, I, I think one of the things that uh, many of us really, I mean, I, I think Milan pointed out something you know, uh, go back and watch on YouTube his comments, and we'll try to recapitulate them. But uh, but he had some some really nice observations. I also would add, and it echoes a little bit what he was saying. Um, the we we really know very little about how states, the context in which states pursue different sorts of tactics, uh, and and. You know, going back to Jen's conceptualization, others people's efforts, your attempt here, I, I think there's, we know so very little that um, there's a lot of opportunity for contribution. And, and as someone who only went to cross-national studies because time series case studies just didn't get respect and didn't get read, um, I don't care if it's China. China is an instance of a state competing with dissidents. So let's study it, of course. Um, and and I love that you're thinking theoretically in general terms rather than trying to think about how do I theorize Chinese repression as if that's distinct somehow. So I, I encourage that, but that that's one potential avenue you might think about. Um, so clearly, everyone everyone jump in. The first thing, the first two things that popped to me were just kind of, um, I mean, I'm interested in kind of repertorial questions. So um, also prop in Jen. Jen. Jen had this cool piece that was basically kind of like repertoires are under theorized, right? And so we've basically been studying this whole thing about like we either study individual tactics or we basically have an index where we're not exploring the relationships between them in any systematic way. Um, but Jen's piece basically had this thing where they were looking at the co-presence of different tactics and then kind of its evolution, I think, over time. Help me if I'm misstating that, Jen. But, but I really like this idea of getting to repertoires and how repertoires are structured. And so I'm fascinated with the Chinese repertoire in part because, like, one, I'm like, it's the culture went on for, the, the culture and the poly went on for so long. And I'm just like, okay, how does that influence, how does that influence kind of like um, the development of a repertoire? Um, what I found interesting about pieces about the kind of um, the Great Cultural Revolution was just like they outsourced a bunch of stuff to local communities. It just like repress one another. And okay, it, is this unique? No. I mean, like if you look at the Great Red Scare in the United States, corporations, movie studios, we had we had the the U.S. had found a way to kind of also crowdsource repressive activity. But I'm also linking these two, right? I'm just like. What was the what's the long term after effect of some of the kind of cultural revolutionary repression on subsequent interactions with different individuals in distinct communities? And so it's a it's it's a larger repertorial question, but it's also kind of temporal and in spatial. So that would be mine. Anybody else? Jump in. Now is the time. Quickly. So the the human rights community care and this this goes it's just dovetails nicely with what Christian was talking about. But the human rights community cares about the substitution of tactics. And we've people have talked about that process for a long time, and there's just not really any evidence that it happens. At least because the indicators are so aggregated, it's really hard to see convincingly that a state has decided I'm going to substitute tactic A for B because of 
it's the strategically optimal choice or because I'm getting pressure or um, the NGOs are talking about us doing us having too many people in prison, so we're going to disappear people now. Um, so that's a topic that people have talked a lot about, but there's not really been any convincing data. And I think in this age of large, on-scale, easily crowdsourceable data sets, um, there's, there's going to be finally opportunities to do that empirically. So in the Chinese context, because there's so much information coming out of there, um, it, that might be possible. So I don't think this is something that you would do with this project, but if as you move forward, it might be something that you build onto. Okay, any last comments from anybody? Because we're at time, but if anybody has a good one, then or you know, a bad one, you know, we'll take we'll take either one. We don't want to judge. We don't want to judge. Okay, well, I have one more. I have one more. Okay, hit it. And if you want to jump down the measurement rabbit hole, I'd be happy for more people to to do that. So um, there's a bunch of great work from the '80s on measurement and human rights um, that not that many people seem to cite anymore. But I'll send it all to you. It's it's really it's really cool actually. Um, human rights was a measurement literature when it started, I think, in part. So, anyway, that's all I'll say. Very good. So, um, thank you. Well, you want to take us out? Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, for for joining us, uh, especially our our discussants who work hard and set aside time, and and of course, that you guys, none of this happens. So. Thank you all for, for being a part of it. Thank you, Roy, for sending it in. Please spread the word. We do we try to do six or seven of these a semester. Uh, if you know uh, PhD students or untenured faculty who you think would benefit, please ask them to, to send in their work the next time we do a call, which will probably be in August for the, well, I don't know, maybe we'll get organized and do it in May or June or something. But it'll be sometime, sometime later this year. So thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you.